ברוכים הבאים, welcome again, and we're getting in this forum, I think what we're really doing is learning to live life from a deeper place, because life itself is not a problem, life itself is, it's a battleground, it's a playground, it's a computer game. It's a place where Hashem's presence can be revealed. And what it means is essentially that your life is not fragmented, that you have a spiritual part and then life, but rather the life that you lead is exactly the place where Hashem placed you. And when you accept that and live from within, what you notice is that you don't need to go somewhere else to find miracles and to find Hashem. You find Him right in your space. And when you live life from a deeper place in your own soul, things actually change in the world around you. And it's quite incredible to watch. Like, you actually kind of like play the game and you learn the rules of the game. And it's difficult to play a game without knowing the rules. So the rules are, like sometimes we just get these snippets, you know, like you watch a, get a WhatsApp and you get a nice clip and it gives you a nice little concept. And it's like very nice. But, and then you get inspired for two minutes, and then you're back to regular. So really what it is, is us being able to live together. And what we're doing in this forum, and it's quite a powerful exercise to be able to do, exercise being translated as um, Litamen, a.k.a. emuna. So it's about increasing the emuna. It's about discovering your own powers and then exercising that muscle time and again. And the goal, of course, is not to remain at the level of a class and learning, but rather to take the knowledge, the idea, the Torah, and apply it and actually work it. So, today, I want to dedicate this class to a very special young man. Um, his name was Yechanan. Ben Ibadele Chaim Tovim Harav Avraham Menachem Mendel. Yechanan is Alava Shalom. He was a young guy in his 30s and he passed away a few weeks ago. Um, I, went to, I went to speak at, um, by uh, Avi Fischoff by Twisted Parenting only two months ago and it was Erevim Kipper when I spoke there. It was amazing. There were like a whole bunch of speakers came and there were a lot of parents and the criteria to come in was parents who they are fasting on Yom Kippur and their child is not fasting and I think I actually mentioned it here at some point and um, the guy who ushered me in who worked over there as a volunteer was Yechanan and I came in and I parked my car and he prepared some cones right there you know down on Schenectady Avenue and he prepared some cones and I was able to park and then he took my keys and he said, in case someone wants to leave, because of the driveway, I'll, um, I'll drive the car. And I gave him my key. Such a sweet neshama. A real, real sweet, sweet person. He used to go to, to Davin. So he never Davin for himself. He used to Davin for other people. He'd take down names. And he used to go to his favorite places were Ribnitz and the oil. Um, and he used to go there all the time and just Davin for people. Now, I encountered him over the last 20 years. Uh, many times in various places because he hung out over there um, and always such a sweet, sweet boy like just an shaman, but very troubled deep inside and um, led a very, very traumatic life and um, a few weeks ago Jochen passed away and it's a real trauma because it's something that we go through it's uh, it's our life, it's our children, it's, hey, it's our reality. Um, put some more chairs there. Um, <clears throat> the reality we deal with is that there's a lot of these kids, and I was thinking today I want to do um, a discussion on I mean, it borders on many different areas, but it's about raising children. 
And so I can't think of anyone better to dedicate it to than Yechanan for his neshama, which hopefully found its peace and its place in the heavenly abode above, and perhaps to be able to reach out to more children down here in this place. And that is because there is a fellow in the Torah who really was a problem child. Like, talk about the best parents who couldn't have been, they can't be better parents than our patriarchs, right? I mean, surely Yitzchak and Rivka would have been the best type of parents you could ever know. And Yitzchak and Rivka produced the child. So they had two kids. One was, you know, they got 50%. Um, but they had a Yaakov, he was amazing. And the other kid was this uh, Esau. And he was notorious. He was an absolute terror. Literally, he would terrorize people. That's what he was doing. And what happened was, um, so Yitzchak, <laughs> we trying to figure out, did he know who Esau was or not? Because Yitzchak was blind at the time. He couldn't see. And if you can't see, you can't know what's going on. So the story is that Esav used to cheat his father. He would lie to him. He would ask questions which made him seem like a holy tzaddik. Very pious. An example of that would be, he would say, Abba, heach me'asrin et How do you take, how do you tithe straw? Now, you tithe oranges and apples and grapes. You take maisa from them. And you bring it and you have to offer them. And the patriarchs, the others, they kept the Torah. So you offer for that, but you don't tithe maiser from hay, from straw. So he would ask a question <coughs> of his father. And his father would say, that's so amazing. Like, wow, you're such a machmir, you're so stringent, you care so much about mitzvahs. And it looks like you're a holy Jew because you're looking to do more good things. So how do you take maiser from Tevin? Oh, you don't. Don't worry. You don't need to. And his father would get the impression that he has this super holy son. Evidently, the son was super successful. Because what ended up happening was that this kid, this kid, um, well, his father really, really and truly appreciated him. And his father thought that he was God's gift to mankind. And so when it came this auspicious moment, and Yitzchak was under the impression, Yitzchak was 123 years old at the time. And he said, I feel like I'm going to pass away. He ended up living almost 60 years more. He died at 180. So why was he thinking he would die? Well, because you, there's a likelihood to pass, more likely to pass away, five years within the range of five years of a parent passing away. Sarah passed away at age 127. So he was now 123 within five years. He thought he was going to pass away also. And so he says, okay, let me give a bracha to my child before I die. So, he's giving a bracha to his child. So he summons, who do you give a bracha to? He summons the favorite child. Exactly. He summons Esav, and he says to Esav, I want to give you a bracha. Now, when you read the story, well, clearly Yitzchak was mistaken, right? And Rivka proved the point that he was mistaken. So it looks like Yitzchak is blind. He was fooled by his son, doesn't get to understand who Esau truly was because Esau was asking him these very pious questions and Esau looked, Esau had tremendous kibudav. His respect for his father was un, off the charts, unparalleled. And he, Yitzchak gets the impression that Esau actually is a good guy. So he wants to give him a bracha. Thankfully, we have a woman in the picture who understands, actually someone who relates to the kids and knows what's flying. And, um, and she says, uh, no, 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 wrong guy. You've got the wrong son. She says, you can't give a bracha to this one. You've got to give a bracha to the other one. So the way the story looks like is that that's the problem when fathers think they know what their children are doing, <laughs> right? That go for the mommy. Is your wife sitting here? <laughs> <laughs> so it looks problematic, right? And it says about Esau, ki tzayid befiv. Tzayid befiv means he would hunt with his mouth. Hunting with his mouth means he knew how to lie and fool his father and ask him the right questions. But if you pay careful attention to the story, you discover that Yitzchak is evidently not, not so disconnected from reality. 
Because here's what happens. Yaakov comes in and he steals the brachas, right? Stole from Esau. When he comes in, Yitzchak is baffled. He says, I don't know what to do. The guy sounds like Yaakov, but, but he feels like Esau. He's blind. What does it mean he sounds like Yaakov? And like, seriously, if you, you can recognize people by their voice. When someone walks into the room and your eyes are closed, you know exactly who it is judging by their voice. If he says, Akol, Kol, Yaakov, then it's very clear. It's done. You know it's Yaakov and not Esau. What's more to discuss? The answer is, he didn't sound like Yaakov or Esau because Yaakov and Esau were twins in every way. They sounded the same. His mannerisms. His mannerisms, exactly. He says, you talk like a Yaakov. How does Yaakov talk? He says, right here. He says, you talk like Yaakov. Why? What, what are the mannerisms of Yaakov? Refined, with blessings, with knowledge, eight kinds. Talk about God. Because yeah. you said, he says, how did you come so fast? He says, Ki hikra Hashem elokecha lefanai. Hashem made it run quickly. If somebody talks, and every time they say, thank you Hashem for that, and this happened, and I was like, I can't, Hashem just made it happen. He says, how would you come so quickly? He says, I don't know. Hashem Elikecho made it happen. He's like, okay, that's not Esau. <laughs> so why exactly will you think you'd give a bracha to Esau? You understand the truth. Clearly you know, right? So why are you thinking to bench Esau, to give a bracha to Esau? Wrong kid. He needs it. Mm. You got, you're onto something there. What's fascinating also is how Rivka behaves. Like, seriously, if you're a wife, and, you know, well, what did Sora do when the same thing happened? Because Avram had also 50%. Okay, but there, there was a different mother. But Sora comes to Avram, and she says, Avram, that kid, no good. And Avram's shocked, because he thinks he's got a great kid. And Hashem tells him, whatever Sora says, Shema Bekola, listen to her. But, but it wasn't really her. It wasn't Why isn't Rivka... Okay, but Rivka could very well and easy have gone over to Yitzchak, sat him down and said, I don't know if you get this, but you're benching the, the, the wrong one. Him, Amalek comes out of him. You know, like, he's bad. Don't go for him. Seriously, take him... Go have a conversation in the kitchen, in private, and say, I just want to tell you something. Wrong kid. He doesn't get it. Like, women have a power. You could actually do that. Can make, like, Sean Bice must have been problematic if she couldn't do that. Why couldn't she go over and talk to him and tell him the truth? Obviously, for some reason, the truth was very clear. Yitzchak knew exactly what he was doing. And for some reason, he still, even though he got the point, understood what he was doing, wanted to do it for a reason, for some reason, that reason was incorrect. And so... We need a switch. And then we've got to see why Rivka didn't tell him, because Rivka wanted it to happen without telling him. And it's quite a spectacular story. And it has the story of how to raise kids. One on how to raise kids, you can't decide whether your kid's going to be a tzaddik or not. You don't have any power over that. Because you could be a Yitzchak and a Rivka, and you get an ace of. But if you want to know how to raise kids, follow what they did, and you'll see how unbelievable it is how incredible it is how they actually successfully raised kids and what they succeeded in accomplishing as a result of that incredible episode so you know the Bartich of a Rebbe was, had this uh, custom essentially he would always be good about Jews no matter what happened he's got something good to say about a Jew so the story goes he meets a Jew who's smoking on Shabbos smoking now, understand all Jewish people were religious. There was no such thing as a non-religious Jew. If you were non-religious, that means you went off the derech, right? Like totally off. Today, it's absolutely fascinating how, like, you know, I, I can't forget the first time I got the question. <coughs> the guy says, a lady said, she says, um, um, I want to know if I need to keep tahrat mishpacha, family purity. Um, why? 
because my husband's not Jewish. So I'm like, what? <laughs> like, where'd that come from? Like, should I keep Taras HaMishpacha but my husband's not Jewish? What on earth are you doing keeping Taras HaMishpacha, family purity, that, that's what you want to do? Like, don't you get the point? <laughs> one or the other? So once upon a time, it used to be very clear the last thing you did was marry a non-Jew. If you were someone who wants to keep family purity, there's no such question as marrying a non-Jew. It is fascinating that there's a coin in Samincha, which is a little ex- um, commentary on the Minchas Chinuch, which is a classical uh, work of, of, um, of an, on Gemara. And there he says that he proves from Esther, who was married to a non-Jew, that, uh, and she was, going, she was going to Mikvah. So the answer is yes, you go. But... The question is fascinating. Kids will be right, but the concept of, of there being mikvanite with it's very strange, right? Yeah, you should go. So these, are, but these are like insane, exotic, if you will, questions. So in the time of the British, these questions don't get asked. But it's a guy smoking. It's the beginning of that, you know, a scholar movement. This whole thing beginning the Enlightenment and. Um, so he goes over to the Jew and he says, you probably don't know that it's Shabbos. He says, I know. It's Saturday today. I'm well aware. He says, you probably don't know that you can't smoke on Shabbos. He's like, nope. Very clear. I know you can't smoke on Shabbos. He says, maybe you're a tinok shenishba. Maybe you didn't get a good education and so nobody taught you the severity of what Shabbos is about. He says, no, Rabbi, get this straight. I know it's Shabbos. I know it's forbidden to smoke on Shabbos. I know what happens to you. You get thrown off a building with uh, the stones behind you for that. I know. And if you warn me, so go ahead. You can warn me. I understand everything. I'm smoking deliberately. What would you call that guy? Hmm? A Russia. A Russia. A low life. What does the Baidichev do? He turns to Hashem and he says, Amazing, these Jews. They're unbelievable. The guy will never lie. <laughs> like, he'll, he'll, he'll be Michal Shabbos, that yes, but to lie? Kidding? Wow. Absolutely not. So, what would you say about the Badi Shabbat? Teddy bear, sweetie pie, that's what you uh, But the kid, he's not, that guy, yeah, he's a low life. That's what you would think. The guy is a low life just because you look at him in a different way. But when we begin to probe a little bit deeper, we see that Badichava is not living in La La Land. He actually has a little bit of an insight that we don't. And the insight is, when, when Hashem created the world, way back when, when He created the world, so in Kabbalah it's called, there was the world of Toihu. Now it's very important to understand this concept, because without it, Life doesn't work. It's a Kabbalistic concept. I'm going to tell it to you. There was a world called the world of Tohu, which is why it says in the beginning of creation, It's a chaotic world. Now, we all go through that chaotic stage in our lives. Like, children are ulama Tohu. Tohu What does that mean? They're like chaotic. So, when he's happy, he's ecstatic. And when he's angry, he's like fuming. Adults, they never get that happy, they never get that upset. Because there's always this brain which tempers it. So that's the new way of... Hashem undid the world of Tohu, and then He went into the world of Tikkun. Tikkun is the world as we see it today, which is a tempered world. The world of Tohu is a chaotic world. Here's the point. Kabbalistically, when the world of Tohu shattered, there were sparks that fell and that there was a holy world, right? And the sparks fell, and the sparks are all over in the world. There's actually 288 sparks throughout history, and our goal is to go capture those sparks. Now, once you understand that, you get how computer games must have been designed by some Jew. Because every computer game, what's it about? There's a goal. The goal is to... I don't know. I, I think I stopped computer games at like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what they get nowadays. But, you know, it's like there's a little thing over there and you, go, you have a little mouth and you've got to go eat up all the little 
treasures things over there, and then you go to grab them, and then you get points, and then you move on to the next screen. That's exactly what happens in life. See, we sometimes train ourselves to wait for olam haba. That's a, that's a side issue. The best place to be is actually olam hazeh. There's stuff to do in this world, and you're playing a game. And your goal is to have a soul and a shama, and to find the sparks. So you go out and you look for these sparks. One, two, three, and you find sparks wherever you go. Where are the sparks? Well, think about it as like uh, nowadays, and you know, you know, the peloton, you know, and the peloton. Peloton has a new game. It's a great game. So they do. They it has resistance, and you put your resistance up and down. So they made the resistance thing. They had like five lanes, and then but you get into your lane, and as you put the resistance, so now you hit this next uh, the next piece. And you like gobble up these little things, and as you gobble them up, you get points, and then you go to, whoosh, and now you're, you know, you increase your your power. So think of life that way. What you're doing is gobbling up. There's power. There's sparks in every moment of tension. When you see a moment of tension, what should you do? Walk right in and bring God to that space. Don't run away from tension because that's where the points are. Run into the tension, right? When you're trying to escape it, that's when you lose it, which we've spoken about many times before. When there's a problematic feeling, don't avoid it. Just say it right there. When you walk into the room and you feel nervous, don't deny it. Just say, I'm feeling nervous, everybody. And then you stop the problem. Problem done. Now we can move forward. In the tension of the moment, that's where the points lie. And there's sparks of holiness everywhere. There's certain people who fall into this world and they have extreme power, incredible sparks, because they fall down big time. Now, we don't know why God chooses some neshamas this way and some neshamas that way. But here's the fact. Watch your kids and you'll see. Some kids are holy tzaddikim the Yaakovs. And some kids are not. They're Aesops. And you're always going to find a reason why because back in the day, yeah, when I was teaching, I did, and the kid, I didn't give him attention and, uh, and this happened and that happened. There's always a reason. The reason is just a garment. What's really going on is that God sent a very lofty spark of an Ashama down into this world and that person has tremendous powers to them. And it's very important. It's very important to grasp it because otherwise we relate to the kid the wrong way. He's a holy child. He's, got, he's just taking you to a deeper place than you've ever been. And when you look at them this way, they become this way. Here's the reality. Every parent, father, grandfather, mother, grandmother, has a problem. It's a big, big problem. This, this is your biggest problem. Because when you're sitting talking about kids or grandkids, there's ways you talk about them. Because you're not in front of them now. So you say, that kid, Ziskite, and Shama, holy kid, like, amazing. Like, oh, he's learning Torah. He goes, you know, he's going to brisk my child and he's learning. I don't know, the kids all day long, where did this come from? Amazing, unbelievable. And you get excited and you're excited when you talk about them. Then you speak about your other kid and you're like, I don't know, that kid, he's a sweetie pie, he's good, but... You know, like everything is bad and always frustrated and always angry and mad and I don't know and it's difficult or whatever. And here's the problem. You're excited about the other kid because he's learning in brisk. And this kid who's not, you're not excited about. Right? You're feeling heavy about that child because you're feeling sorry that, oh, that kid is uh, whatever. Tough, tough, tough kid. Still love him, don't get me wrong. I still love him. He's my kid. Right? What you want to do is get to the spark of the child, which means, okay, what's good about that child? Every child has something good about it. Look at the stuff that's good in that child. That's the spark from the world of Tohu, which fell down and is inside this child. Look at that spark and then hone in on it, focus until you like latch in completely and that's all you can see and start living in La La Land about the rest of what the child is. 
So let's say you have an ASAP. And, and I mean, we don't want to go through what ASAP did. But he was pretty bad. He was horrendous. We have them. He was a horrible kid in every way. But there was something that he did that was absolutely out of this world. What was that? Kibudav. And so when he came along and he asked that question, <coughs> so everybody else saw hypocrite, low life. Not only are you wicked, you're also trying to fool your father. His father was one of the most incredible education, educators you can ever imagine. His father said, Wow. I have a kid who says, Hey, ach, I have a kid who deep down is looking to do the right thing. Like the Bradichada with the Yidu smokes on Shabbos. Oh my gosh, but he doesn't, he doesn't lie. Now you'll say, but, but you, you didn't notice the other part? I noticed it. Okay. I feel terrible. <laughs> I really feel terrible that he's, that he's that's Shabbos and he's smoking. That's horrible. But my job is to get excited and focus on the good because I'm not a spectator in the story. When you're sitting with your friends talking about your child, you feel like a spectator. My child's out there and I'm over here. That's the problem. You're not a spectator. You are the power of the child. What you think, no, 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 not think. What you feel about the child becomes the reality, the capsule which they live in. That's the problem with parents. That for good and for not so good, you're the capsule in which your child lives. What you think, no, what you feel, right? You got the difference? What you think is what you just say, but what you feel about the child is what they are. So Yitzchak takes his child, this Esav, he knows exactly what he is. He knows the guy doesn't mention Hashem's name. He says, I'm going to encapsulate him in this reality. And he says, okay, what's good about him? So he's looking for the good. Find me the good. He finds the good. Hones in on that. And then he says, okay, focus, focus, focus. And he brings in the most incredible stuff out there. Because you've got to understand the rules of this computer game. The rules of the game are, how the problem begin in the first place? We know to the world of Toyo, which shattered. There was another thing that happened that was a little more well known to us. And that was, there was a, a tree of knowledge and Adam and Eve were told not to eat on the tree. But they did. How on earth do you get told not to eat? One thing you're not allowed to do and they're holy people. One thing for three hours and they focus and, and they, they fail in that. What's the answer? The answer is there was a snake. How did the snake successfully <clears throat> achieve the impossible? to get Adam and Eve to go against their creator who made them? The answer is, he used mirma. Mirma, deceit. What did he do? He tricked her. First of all, he didn't go to Adam, he went to Chava. Second of all, he didn't tell Chava the truth. He, he said, it was about, right? she added the touching, so he honed in on that. And then he said, Oh, so you can't touch it. So then he pushed her against the tree. She felt the tree. Then he says, yeah, and guess what? You're actually going to become closer to Hashem. So he enticed her and that's why she fell. He tricked her. If he tricked her and all bad began from trickery, the only way to win the battle against the bad is right in the tension of trickery. Walk right in and get the spark in the trickery. It's always accomplished through trickery. What Yitzchak did with Esav is the exact opposite of what the snake did with the Eitz Das. Das means knowledge. Mirma is the opposite of knowledge, deceit, when you are fooled. So if knowledge gets you the connection, then foolishness gets you the opposite. Well, guess what? Yitzchak says, I'm going to use what appears to be foolishness. It looked like he was fooled. He wasn't fooled. He understands exactly who Esav is. He sits there and he just gets excited by Esav. Did Yitzchak succeed with Esav? Yes or no? He appears to have failed dismally. Not true. He actually succeeded immensely. What he succeeded in doing was, Esav had sparks inside of him. Enters into the tension, pulls out the sparks from Esav. Who were the sparks? You ever open up a chumash? And what do you see on the side of the chumash? Every chumash has it. Onkelos. 
Who was Onkelos? He was a, a Roman convert. His, his uncle was, um, was the Caesar. Have you ever uh, heard of Hillel Shammai? Yeah. Who were their, their teachers, Hillel Shammai? Shmaya and Avtalion. Shmaya and Avtalion were converts, Asabites. How about Mishnayas? You ever open up a Mishnah and learn Mishnayot? Who wrote the Mishnayot? Rebbe. Every Mishnah which doesn't have a name, Stam Mishnah, Rabbi Meir. Who was Rabbi Meir? Convert. Asav. Ovadia is a prophet. Avad is a prophet who prophesied about the demise of Edom. And what do we say? Mineu be'aba lishti be'narga. That the wood, the, the axe that cuts the forest comes from the forest itself. Avadia was a convert of Edom. Of course he succeeded. He couldn't change the ace of himself. But what he successfully did was brought the sparks out which means the good people who were embedded in Esav, he succeeded in drawing them out. When he thinks it's Esav, and he says, let me give you a bracha, the words he uses are, va'avarechecha lifnei Hashem. He says, my dear child, I'm going to place you right in front of God, the way God looks at you. And I'm going to start looking at you the way Hashem looks at you. And if I look at you the way Hashem looks at you, I'm going to change your whole reality. Now the truth is, this doesn't only apply to education. I just want to show you how it applies to life itself, right? Let's say you've got a problem. I don't know, something's bothering you. And any issue in life is bothering you, it's frustrating you. You're trying to get married and you can't find someone to marry. You're a boss and you're trying to find the secretary and you can't find the secretary. Any one of these little, you know, bothersome pieces of life. So what happens to us? When something doesn't go your way, how do you feel? Frustrated. frustrated and stressed. And we somehow associate frustration and stress with producing results. Like, you want me to be relaxed? If I'm relaxed, how am I going to find what I want? So the more you can't find it, the more frustrated you get. Right? A vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. And it's very weird, but we actually believe that getting frustrated will produce results. And that not getting frustrated means you're just sitting over there doing nothing about it. So it's a problem. Now the truth is, and this is hard work, want to get results? Try this. Time tested. Help anyone find their shidduch. Help anyone find their secretary. Help you find exactly what you need. It's quite miraculous. But it works. Try it out. Go for the spark. There's a spark of good in there. You always want to look at what's good. Now, you don't need to actually find like the good in this situation. You just need to feel good. Feel happy and good in your heart. When you feel good, you bring good things to you. When you feel frustrated, you bring that to you. So, the more frustrated you are, the more you repel the energy of whatever you want to achieve. So, if you want your child to go like, well off the path, simple. Here's the, how to do it. Just get frustrated about whatever they're doing. The more frustrated you get, the more they'll run away from you. That's the truth. You get frustrated, and they'll go, see you later. But not only your children, it's with everyone. It's everything that happens in life. Watch it. Watch people. We're all like that. I don't know why, but in today's world, we love negative thinking. We love it. I love to see the worst possible thing. Because you see, what, you see what's going on with everybody else, right? What's the problem with thinking good about your kid? Because you see everybody else, and you're like, your kid, okay, I get it. I went to this class, and they taught me about how to have a good, a good relation, whatever, but it doesn't apply to me. You just be good anyway. <laughs> like, what's the problem? Just dab. No, watch how to do it. You just ba -ba 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 -ba. you dab and you said you put on film like that. Dab. It's very simple to do. Yeah, good luck. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And maybe you want to fall a bunch of times till you realize it doesn't work. Stress does not get you anywhere. So the problem is it's much easier to be stressed. 
It's much easier to think bad about your kid. If you have an ace of, it's much easier to think about all the ace of things. And then you say, listen, if I don't think about it, you guess what's going to happen? He's going to get worse. I'm a parent. I need to be mindful of all these things. No parent has ever succeeded in changing anything in their kids. But if you ignore it, it's, it could get worse. Right. There are people that need professional help. Yep. It's not enough. You want to know what the professionals do? <laughs> when you say, let's go to professional help, it's a great statement. You need to get help. I always wonder, what if you're the help? What would you do then? You need to get help. Got it. You need to get help. What do you think the help's going to do? I- I'm not saying get help. I'm not taking that away. Right? What do you think the help's going to do? They're going to go very deep. Which means, if you have an ASAF, you can't treat him normal. You can't. You have to go deep. Because he's an ASAF. can't ignore the problem. That's why you need to give him a bracha. That's why, get the story? If Rivka would have come over to Yitzchak and said, Yitzchak, you can't give him a bracha. He's horrible. He's a disaster. Give the bracha to Yaakov. What would Yitzchak say? No. Why not? No. Yaakov doesn't need a bracha. He's okay. He's good. Why should I give Yaakov a bracha? He's a tzaddik. He's a holy Jew. That's what he said. So what does she do? She has to fool him to get the bracha. That's what she did. You can't just... You don't need a bracha if you're amazing. So if you see that your child is an ace of and you notice the problems in your child, what do you want to do? You want, you have to go deep, deep, deep into the soul of the child because you see the problem. So that's hard work. How do you do it? You got to say, okay, close your eyes. What is good about this child? Or any situation in life which you're stressed by. What is good about my situation? It's so hard. I'm going to tell you this straight out in case anyone wants to ask the question, I'll preempt. This ain't easy. There's nothing more difficult than thinking good when you're stressed. It's much easier, much more comfortable to say, heck with the whole thing, I just want to be stressed. I feel good, I feel comfortable. And then it doesn't work and I can say, see, I told you so, and feel the, yeah. If you want to actually get success, no matter how stressful it is, you say, I feel the stress. doesn't mean I feel the stress of my child. I feel horrible about what's going on. And then I focus and I say, but what's awesome? And I hone in on that. And I live my life in that space like the Bhaditshara. <coughs> and when you hear me talking about my kid, what are you going to hear me talking about? Good. Good Cannot, it was just amazing. Like, like he wakes up in the morning and he comes and he, and, and like last week on Tuesday, he came and he dabbed him uh, with the minion. Amazing, unbelievable. Like, I, I don't know where that came from. Talk about it with more excitement than your kid who's learning 24-7 in brisk. Because he needs more excitement, that's why. And then you say, uh, hello, you don't get what your child is? Yes, I do. That's why I'm going deeper to get there. So when, Yitz, when Esau walks in, what does Yitzchak say? He thinks it's Esau, he doesn't realize it's actually Yaakov. He says, Look, look, he sniffed his child. What's with the sniffing? Reach bini? You know what smell is? You have your five senses. Most of them are actual, tangible. When you see, you see. When you hear, you actually hear it. Feel it. But when you smell something, it's an intangible. That's exactly what he was smelling. He said, there's nothing going on over here, so I've got to go for a sweet smell. What's funny about smell, what's strange about smell, is that good things don't really smell good. I, I, I don't know how you make perfume, but I'm, I believe perfume is made from not such good things. That it's actually bitter stuff that makes the good smell. Right. And that the better the smell, the, the more challenging, the more harif. Right? The, 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 the sour stuff has a stronger smell. So when you want to wake up someone who's in a state of, uh, in a fainted state, how do you wake them up? Salt. You put some, yeah, exactly, by their mouth, and like something harsh, that wakes them up. 
Seeing doesn't wake them up. Hearing doesn't wake them up. You can make massive noise. It's not going to wake them up. Feeling? Nothing. Smell, which is an intangible. The smell, the scent, is what the neshama hears. The soul gets it. Yitzchak says, Re'ei re'ach b'ni, k're'ach sodeh asher b'erach Hashem. Vayorach es re'ach, the God of, he smelled, he sniffed. The scent is what got to him. Look at your child and say, what smells good about this child? Smell is not something tangible. I have nothing tangible. All I have is a scent. But if you hone in on that scent, you'll discover more. So when you say, hey, you're a parent who's not noticing what's going on. You say, listen, when you hear something bad about your child, you feel the bad. Don't ignore it. Feel it. Feel it. Don't say, no, he's, don't deny it. He's good. No. Feel the bad. Feel the problem. And then say, okay, Hashem has this child. His is his child. God, your kid. What's amazing about this kid? What's godly about this kid? You're going to need to use your sniffing powers. And you'll find the beauty. And you'll hone in on that. You know what he says? How does a field work? You water a field. Strangest phenomenon that you see. That if you put mud in, if you put, I mean, uh, soil into water. What's going to happen to the water? It'll get dirty. But where do you find the cleanest, purest water? The one you think you're getting when you get the Poland Springs. In the Mayan. Where does the Mayan come from? Where does the spring come from? The water which goes through the ground is actually the purest water. Want to explain the contradiction? Strange. The dirtiest water is dirtied by the ground, but the cleanest water is cleaned by the ground. So how does that work? Sometimes the soil grabs the water and penetrates him and becomes a part of him. And sometimes the water just walks straight through the soil. He has a goal, he has a purpose and a vision, and then the soil not only doesn't dirty you, it actually purifies you. Every child who has this soil, this dirt, is embedded in the dirt. It's a problem. Now you choose. Are they going to get dirtied by the dirt? Or are they going to go deeper by the dirt? When your child says, I'm not keeping Shabbos, you are a parent and you focus on, yeah, but, but they don't lie, right? Like the Baditshiva. You find what's good. So you say, okay, but what's awesome about this kid? So now when the kid says to you, I don't, I'm not keeping Shabbos, you know what you hear? All I heard was, I want to really get what Shabbos is. Because what you're keeping Shabbos is just cultural. You're just sitting there. Just I, I'm not, I want to know what Shabbos really is. And so, and you, you don't know the answer, right? So what you're going to do is go deep into your soul and say, what an amazing kid. Because there's something, focus on that. And you live in that space all the time of how awesome they are. And you're going to feel the difficult moments. Yes, you will. And whenever you feel those difficult moments, you let yourself breathe heavily and you go, okay, I'm going to find what smells good about him, what's beautiful and amazing about him. So Rivka got this part. She got it. So she understood that the only way that Yitzchak's not going to give a bracha to Yaakov because Yaakov doesn't need the bracha. He's not going to give him the blessing. So who's he going to bless? Only Esav. So she says, okay, but Esav, you are making a mistake because Esav is way out there. So Yitzchak successfully, by wanting to give a bracha to Esav, already drew out of him the sparks. But Rivka said to him, okay, but Yaakov needs to do this. We need to give a bracha to Yaakov. But the only way to give a bracha to Yaakov is if Yaakov becomes an Esav. So she couldn't go tell him the truth. So what does she do? My question is, both of them, both sons, wanted the blessing. Right. What if you have a child who doesn't want the blessing? He doesn't want it. So he then says, you, I don't want your blessing. I, right. don't want to, I don't want to be near you. Maybe you want to become a Yitzchak to be able to really give the blessing deep down. Which means, if your child feels that you want to give the blessing to the Esav, right? a parent who wants to give a blessing to a child, wants them, what's the blessing? The blessing is you should be awesome. I mean, you should have a lot of uh, in your learning and success and all that. That's great then he doesn't want that bracha. The bracha that, Yaakov get, that Yitzchak gave 
was you should have a lot of money, you should have uh, tremendous power, and I'm gonna show you how you can make, make a killing. You can be the most successful person ever. So Talk his language. The then he wants it. <laughs> how does Yaakov get the bracha? Very simple. He puts on the clothing, literally and figuratively, uh, figuratively of Esau. What did he do? A, he put on the garments. B, he made himself into an Esau. He says, if the only way to get a bracha is by being an Esau who lies to my father, by asking him questions that are not true and whatever, like the taking mice at the tithing of the straw, he said, I'll do the same thing. This is all his mother's idea. She's like, okay, what you do is you're going to walk inside there and you're going to cheat him. And so he walks in and he cheats him. And when y- Yaakov walked in, Yitzchak was blown away. He's like, I don't know what's going on over here because he sounds like a Yaakov, but he's everything I ever wanted. And he notices the most unbelievable things over here. So the Medrash tells us, Vayorach esreyach begodov. What's begadav? See, Yaakov has a problem. He doesn't, he's a good guy. But Yaakov knows he's going to have a lot of children coming out of him. Big problems, his children. So the ones who are holy, the Ishtom, Yeshev, Yeholim, they don't need a bracha. They're good. It's the ones who are off that need a bracha. So how do I attract them to? So what does Yaakov do? Yaakov walks straight into the tension. Right there. <coughs> it says when he smelled his clothing, Medrash Rabbah says, begadav. That sniff of the clothing. He smelled an Esav in the Yaakov. The Medrash says, who did he smell? There were two people who came out of Yaakov. That are examples of the traitors of Yaakov. One is Yakum Ish Tzroyrois, and the other one is Yosef Meshisa. Yakum Ish Tzroyrois, the story was that when the, when the enemies entered into the Beis HaMikdash, they were too scared to walk into the Holy Temple because they were, they were scared of the spell and the Jews and the God of the Jews. So they realized the only way to get to destroy the Temple is if a Jew does it. So they said, which Jew is willing to go in? Whatever you get out, the first thing you get out is yours. There was a fellow, a traitor, a lowly, disgusting, vile traitor by the name of, y- of Yakum Ish Tzroyrois. He said, I'll do it. Walked inside, took out the best vessel, which was the Menorah. It's mine. The Menorah is yours. He walked out and these enemies saw it and they said, that's so unbelievable. You can't use that. A king has to use that. When he heard those words, it touched his soul. A king has to use that? God is the only king. And they said, go back and we promise you whatever you take now is yours. He said, no way. I angered Hashem once. I'm not going a second time. They said, we'll give you three years of taxes of the whole Judea. He said, I angered Hashem once, I'm not going again. They said, if you don't go, we're going to kill you. He said, I don't care, I angered Hashem, I'm not doing it again. This traitor, they took him and they put him on a carpenter's uh, table and they chopped up his body slowly but surely. That's the measure says. And every time he was horror, gruesomely murdered, he said, that's because I angered Hashem. How on earth did Jews reach that level? The worst Jew, the traitor, is the holiest of the holy Jews. And Yosef Neshisa, he had an uncle by Yese, the name of, of Rabbi Yosef ben Yezer. Yosef ben Yezer was a tanner. He was taken out and he was about to be hanged. And his nephew was riding because he was a traitor. So he was riding on a donkey. He was excited. And the uncle, he says to the uncle, see, look what happens to you and look what happens to me. You, learn Torah, look how they kill you. Look what happens to me because I don't. Be like me. So he says to him, yeah, but what's going to happen? There's a world to come. And which way are you going? Which way am I going? Something touched this guy. And he went and he, a whole story, but we'll get into the gruesome details, but he did tshuva. And he changed his ways. And when Yesa Ben was dying, he saw his nephew, who was also dying. He saw him, and he said, he's going ahead of me. The traitors, the Bogdim, are the best people. Those kids who you think are off the derech are not off the derech. It's the wrong name. They're not off, they're on. They're closer to Hashem than you could ever imagine. They're searching, they're looking, they are challenging you to go deeper. It's not comfortable. It's very, very, very difficult to have those children. But they're looking to bring you to a space called Teshuva. Teshuva is a holier place, a deeper connection than you could ever imagine with God. And that's where they're taking you to. And what you want to do is recognize that and understand and appreciate that even though I have ideas of what a child needs to be, and I know what Chinuch is and what you're supposed to be, but God has those sparks from the world of Toyo which fell down into this world. And sometimes it's the seat. It's the seat that got us into this problem. It's the seat that's going to get us out of it. 
What's at the seat? God sends very holy people, very holy neshamas, and puts them in very difficult situations. That's the kids, those kids. They're awesome, they're unbelievable. They need parents and grandparents and family members who look at them and see the beauty and focus like Yitzchak and hone in on the beauty. And then you discover that you smell the beauty of it. And what do you see? Awesomeness. You see specialness. And what that does is it draws it out. Because if you have a parent who believes in you and realizes how amazing you are, you will inevitably gravitate and get pulled back. That's a pull. It's a magnetic pull. It's a staying power that you need because it's so tough. Because in the real deal, it looks like everything's going wrong. Everything's actually going right. And then what happens is the good kids realize that there's a power in Teshuvah. That our God is not a cultural God. Our God is unlimited. And that we have the power to find ourselves and to connect to Hashem. See, Yaakov knew all way. Yaakov was learning Torah. But what he wanted was to bring Hashem into the Torah. Not just into the Torah. When you, that you, if I'm sitting in, in, in my coil in Lakewood and Meir and I'm learning. That's great. Yaakov wanted to reveal Hashem in the physical. He wanted to bring the power of God right into the physical world so you can tell stories in Torah and have mitzvahs and all these physical things that you're doing to reveal God right there. And so he had to fool physicality. He had to fool Gashmias. The whole Torah, what's it about? It's a computer game. The game of life. To bring God into the physical world. Whenever you learn Torah, you're revealing God in the physical world. You're learning about physical things and physical mitzvahs and you're drawing Hashem into the material world. And then there's a very special holy people who dive right in. And they become part of the reality of physicality and materialism. And um, they look to us like Aesop. They look to us like Rishon. They're not. They're these people who are deceiving the world. Just like the Nachash, the snake, deceived Chava. These kids are <coughs> deceiving, deceiving the world. They're pretending to be bad. They're not bad. They're supercharged, super good. They're messengers of all of us who are entering right into the deceit mm-hmm. and, um, and changing it and transforming it. And what they need is people who believe in them because they're on a mm-hmm. tough, tough mission. It's not a simple place to be in. The truth is, all of us are on that mission. The truth is, every single person, every one of us, the ones who look like holy tzaddikim, we got problems. We know ourselves. We know the truth. That maybe is what hurts us. We know where the kids come from. We know what in us threw that out. And that's the hurtful part. But all of us, we're not wounded animals. We're godly people taking Hashem to a place where He never was before. That's what Yitzchak wanted. That's what Mama Rivka realized. She realized the power. And that's what every Yiddish Mama needs to realize. It's realize the focus. That kid, unreal, awesome. Get excited. Tell all your friends about how exciting it is. Your friends are going to say to you, wow, that woman is living in a whole different reality. And you say, oh no, she knows. She gets who the child is. And she gets the power that lies embedded in that child. Because that power is how you deceive the physicality. And you deceive the gashmis and you draw godliness right out. It's a divine, holy power. It's the power vested in you. Well, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.